Does that seem like a really fast 30 seconds to you? <laughs> it sure does, yeah. Well, I was hoping there's like emergency vehicles screaming by in the wonderful city of Chicago, and I was hoping that the sirens would stop before the 30 seconds ended. I'm sure I was hoping they'd continue. Cap down the road, yeah. <laughs> the sounds of the city. So by the way, yeah. when you log on, if you notice you log on to StreamYard, and it gives you these little things, and it says, if you check your lighting, it can make you look amazing. Well, I checked my lighting, and neither neither of us look amazing. Let's pick you, dial it back a little bit, people. It'll make you look acceptable, how about? Yeah, that? I mean, I, come on. I, I know plastic <laughs> surgery wouldn't make me look amazing. Make you look amazing, right? A head exactly. transplant. If I had a head <laughs> transplant with Brad Pitt, they'd be like, why is Brad Pitt all fat now? Be ridiculous. <laughs> oh, you're not fat anymore. Uh, I'm just kidding. You never <laughs> were. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, welcome to the Trader's Edge podcast. Thank you guys for waiting around. We had some technical difficulties. I'm Jim Urio. That's Bob Iacchino. Today we have one of our favorite guests, um, who is Mike Singleton of Invictus Research, who this is our third time we've had him on a podcast. And I consider it a victory because if, if, if you guys know Mike, he's a very, he's a serious and very intense young man. And we've gotten him to loosen up a little bit. And I'm giving ourselves credit for that. Bobby, do you agree? Totally agree. He's just like, he's very serious about what he does. And because of that, his research is honestly, oh, it's some of the best I've ever seen. Oh, he, it's outstanding. He's well, a, no, one he's of these a, days we'll get him to cuss on camera. Right, It'll happen. That's somewhere. what we're trying to do today. So you people keep score. If we could get him to say any of the awful words that we say from being on the trading floor to be a victory. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Singleton. I'm starting to think that entry is more like more like the uh, old Tetris game, where if you're at the bottom, it's more successful. Oh, could be, right. Mike, what do you think? Who should be on the top, Bobby or I? <laughs> you don't have to answer. <laughs> I think this should be a th totally equal. I, I was going to say, man, that was a great introduction. I feel like I'm going on 60 Minutes. I'd like to say that Bobby's will. take on the intro is a bullshit intro. Why don't you say it's a bullshit <laughs> thing? I'll just say that. Uh, Mike He's not is doing a it. Notre Dame graduate, and right before we came on, we were talking about it because my new son-in-law to be is is a Notre Dame graduate. And when you grow up in the Chicago area, most people know is you either love Notre Dame or hate Notre Dame. It's very rare that someone jumps camp, but I've been forced to jump camp because I've been meeting people. Well, first I met Jeff Kilberg and been friends with him for twenty years, and he made me hate it worse. But guys like Mike Singleton and my new son-in-law are making me like Notre Dame. So to Notre Dame, thank you for that, Mike. That's generous. Thank you. I don't have to explain sure. myself, right? <laughs> Not at all. Right. All right. Okay, let's jump right into it because these people have been waiting around a little bit. Um, do you want to talk about uh, equities right away, Bobby, in the chart? Or do you want to? Because I want to talk about rates first because I think let's rates about are rates first. Let's go okay. to rates first. So on yesterday we spoke to Nancy Davis, Bobby and I did. And mm -hmm. you know, she's brilliant. I. It seems like I'm alone here and I'm curious if you're in my camp. I thought on October 11th when that 30-year auction went poorly, right around the same time that it was being announced another $106 billion aid package was going to both Ukraine and Israel. I think the market was kind of flexing its muscles and saying, sure, you can borrow as much money as you want, but it's not gonna be at the rates you think. I think that's a big deal. Gold happened to rally $100, not really as much on the war as I think it did on the poor auction. Am I reading too much into it? Or are you worried about the markets getting a little saturated with our paper? Are you asking me? Yeah. yeah so well, you're the guest. Who do you think we're asking? <laughs> Bobby's got a lot of good opinions on this too. It's not just me. <laughs> you're the guest. Maybe I do like Notre Dame. <laughs> right. You know what? <laughs> yeah. So I, I think, well, a couple of things. I mean, I think obviously rates have been going higher since April. And if you zoomed out, they've been going higher than that or higher for longer since then. But um yeah, I mean, the reasons that rates have been going up are really threefold, at least the way we think about it at Invictus. I mean, one, the Fed has been hiking uh, the Fed funds rate for a while now. And generally, there's about uh, a 91% correlation between the Fed funds rate and, say, the 10-year. I know when I first started in the business, I was I was told that the Fed controls short rates, but long rates are controlled by market forces. You know, kind of true, kind of not. I mean, if you run regressions, uh, basically 80% of the price action in long rates is explainable by what the Fed does. And only about 20% is explainable by market action. So you really have to pay attention to what the Fed is doing to trade long rates too. And uh, the fact that the Fed has kept the front end of the yield curve high has been an upward influence on the long rate 
you know, at Invictus, I think they're probably going to hike another 25 basis points. Uh, you know, maybe not in the November meeting, maybe it's December or January, but uh, unless economic conditions deteriorate really, really quickly, uh, we think they probably squeeze in another 25 basis points. On top of that, you've got quantitative tightening, which no one talks about anymore. $95 billion a month in quantitative tightening is about 10 basis points a month in terms of, uh, it's about 10 basis, it's about the equivalent of a 10 basis point rate hike each month in terms of the impact on the tenure and financial conditions. And of course, uh, the Treasury issuing, you know, $340 billion worth of coupons in Q4 is the equivalent of another 30 or 40 basis points. And so you add all of that together and you more or less have explained the move we've seen in, uh, in long rates, in particular, the tenure over the last uh, few weeks and months. That said, from sort of a trading perspective, I see resistance for the 10 year, or you might say support for the 10 year note around 525 or maybe 5.2%. So I think from a trading perspective and in terms of the risk reward of getting short the 10 year note here or long term bonds, I don't think it's particularly attractive. But I do want to acknowledge that those fundamental forces I mentioned earlier, you know, economic conditions remaining pretty resilient, uh, which has caused rate hikes to get priced out of the long end of the curve, uh, you know, quantitative tightening. Rate eases. Yeah, the, the treasury schedule. None of those have changed. So, right. from a trading perspective, I don't know that you want to be doubling down on your shorts here. But from a fundamental perspective, um, you know, there's there's still some juice left in the tank. I think. So, Mike, I obviously read your research every morning. So does Jim. We've talked about that with you before. And one of the things that you've been, I want to say, harping on, but you've mentioned it more than once: the issuance, and just the, I don't know, could we call it record issuance? That's been happening. I mean, it's massive, massive issuance, right? And the Fed, on the other hand, has constantly said, well, you know, rates are going to be high, higher for longer. I think it was uh, Susan Collins and Michelle Bowman that said maybe not higher for longer, but high for longer, right? I, I'm not sure what the difference is. But when I look at it from that perspective, who is not telling the truth? The amount of issuance that all of us basically believe is going to continue to put push at least 10 year out rates higher or the Fed. And do you think their first move is going from quantitative ice tightening to yield curve control with more easing or are they going to cut rates if they do move at all? So I think that various Fed governors are observing that labor market conditions are easing on the margins and generally the Fed doesn't like to surprise the markets. So I think in the event that there is sort of a nonlinear break in the labor market and economic conditions, they're they're trying to create some line of sight into less hawkish policy. That said, I think that they are going to be in general biased hawkish, biased toward keeping rates higher for longer as long as the proximate drivers of above trend inflation have not been addressed. So at this point in the inflation cycle, what does that mean? Well, it means uh, you know, wage growth growing too fast, right? Uh, there's a, a mental model that the Fed uses and references a lot, and it's that inflation is equal to wage growth, less productivity growth. Right now, if you look at all of the wage data in aggregate, and there's 20 different measures you can look at and that the Fed looks at, in aggregate, wage growth is kind of trending between four and four and a half percent on an annualized basis, and uh, productivity growth is flat ish. So, what that implies is the underlying trend in inflation is call it 4%. And you're seeing headline inflation data kind of hook back toward 4% recently, if you just look at the most recent year over year numbers. And uh, obviously that's not what the Fed wants. So I think that the Fed is going to be biased hawkish, biased toward maybe one more rate hike, like I said earlier, until it believes that uh, those, those drivers have been addressed. So really the tight labor market. And the reason I call it approximate driver and not a principal driver is because I don't like blaming inflation on wage growth, because I think that's it's not the real driver, but money printing leads to non-productive wage growth and an unproductively tight labor market, which does lead to inflation. So I think, you know, ultimately that, that tends to be addressed through a recession. And I think that's that's probably the most likely outcome over the next, you know, three months or so. Um, but I just wanted to make that clear. So a quick follow up then in, in terms of do you at Invictus think then that if the Fed Let's say that they leave rates and they're just like, no, we're not moving rates. And Jimmy mentioned this yesterday to Nancy when we were talking to, again, Nancy Davis from Quadratic Capital. He said that he thinks the Fed will uh, just stop with quantitative tightening and just say, well, we're just going to reinvest now and not call it easing. 
right? Not call it a quantitative easing until the point comes where they're going to buy rate or buy bonds going back to quantitative easing. But then they're going to say, well, we said we were going to leave rates where they are. And we did. We left rates where they are. We hiked, tightened one, one more 25 base point rate hike. And then we left rates just like we said we were going. It's kind of like that trick that husbands used to pull. If, you know, I'm, not, I'm going to be home early tonight on, okay, get home at four in the morning. Like what happened? Well, it's early in the morning. I said, I'd be home early. I'm home early. You know, it seems like a little trick with words that the Fed might be doing. So how does Invictus see quantitative tightening versus easing if that's going to be the next move? How does it affect the market? So I think that unless my my impression from listening to the different speeches from the Fed governors and from Jay Powell is that they are inclined to keep quantitative tightening in, in action, uh, essentially until there's some sort of systemic financial risk that requires more reserves in the financial system. Um, and so what I think that means is they're going to let the yield curve steepen in the event of a recession, that they're going to cut short rates like they usually do, maybe by two or 300 basis points, but they're going to let long rates remain high. And I think that right now their modal outcome is that the U.S. economy is resi resilient enough to handle that. I don't think they would go out of their way to make that point in their speeches over and over again if that wasn't what they were preparing the market for. And so that's my expectation for now. Um, you know, that said, it's it's easy to say that before a recession happens and before the unemployment rate starts to go up uh, in sort of a nonlinear, really scary way. And recessions have these notorious feedback loops where, uh, you know, the rise in unemployment creates really unpredictable outcomes in consumption and, and income. And, uh, you know, we'll see if if Jay Powell is able to, to stick to his word and to his guidance on that one. But I, I think that's clearly what they're preparing us for as investors. So so what Mike Bobby was just the Mike Tyson quote we used all the time is that everybody has a plan until they, they get punched in the face. And we've actually seen that play out in Fed governors in the past. I believe it was August mm. of maybe I can't remember what year it was where they were getting ready to tighten. And all of a sudden the stock market broke 8 percent quickly. And they were like just the next day. James Bullard came out and said, the case for tightening is less compelling. The only thing that's less compelling is that the stock market broke a shit ton. So <laughs> let's be serious about that, which leads me to my actual question was about equity markets, because I've been bear on equity markets for a few months. And today was another awful day. I think we were down at our lows, down like 0.98%, uh, maybe 9.8% from just the highs from a couple of months ago. I think it was July. Is the stock market reacting to volatility in the long end? Is it is it the net level of rates in the long end, which is like you can't compete with that any longer? Combination of both. What do you think? So I think what you're seeing right now, since uh, when did the market peak? Late July, early July. I guess yeah. it was July. Yeah. I think what yeah. you've seen from July onward is essentially what you saw in 2022, which is a rates driven decline in you know in stocks that's driven by you know repricing and valuations. Essentially, you're not really yet seeing strong cyclical risk get priced in, right? If you looked at the ratio of stocks to bonds, if you looked at the ratio of the S&P 500 to IEF, which is sort of a like duration treasury ETF, uh, it's still in an uptrend, right? When stocks are outperforming bonds, that's indicative of a market that's not really pricing in significant earnings risk. Uh, likewise, you could look at, at you know credit spreads, right? Um, I haven't looked at them in the last two days, maybe, but... Um, Credit spreads have been incredibly muted since last June. I mean, re remarkably so given growth conditions. And again, that's indicative of a market that's not not pricing in earnings risk, which is to say credit risk. Um, and so, you know, in terms of what's driving stock market, you know, stock market performance lower and all the indexes have sold off. Uh, you know, when you look at the market internals, it's really hard to say the stock market is pricing in recessionary earnings. It's just not. It's, it's pricing in higher discount rates. That's what I see. Mm -hmm. So I want to jump to something if I could, because... Today, you tweeted something that struck me. Um, before I show the tweet, I have been telling people for a long time that I remember reading a study that said the S&P 500 is in a drawdown from a new high about 75% of the time. And I used it, even though I never really saw the study, right? It sounded right to me that, you know, mm -hmm. we make a new high and then you're down for three days. Then you go up and make another new high. You're down for five days. It just seemed to make sense to me logically, right? But still, when you look at an S&P chart from here to here, it's straight up, right? Theoretically, if you're looking at like a monthly chart. But I always try to explain to people that just like people in 2007, 2008 thought their house could never go down, equities can go down too. Remember real estate can never go down? 
You might sure. have been in college. You might have been in high school, Mike, but Jim was here. Yeah. Um, let's put this tweet up if we could. You just tell me when you can see the tweet because I'm not looking at you guys right now. Yep. Okay. I can see it. Mike Singleton, what's your Twitter handle real quick or your X handle, Mike, just before I read this? It's at Invictus Macro. Okay. The quote is, stocks always go up. Mike replies, but what's your time horizon? Since 1905, there have been four decade plus periods when stocks went sideways in real terms. In fact, these periods represent 64 of the last 118 years. Talk about that more because one of the things that I really dislike trying to explain to people is that stocks don't always go up. As a matter of fact, most of the time they're selling off from a new high, even a stock like NVIDIA, where you saw it go up, what, since mid-May, almost 70% on its lows of the move down, lost 50% of that move. So explain what you meant by that and explain that chart if you could. Right. Well, it was the, this is a chart from the Daily Edge, which is our daily video. And the Daily Edge usually has two segments. It's the top three things that matter and the top three things that don't matter. And this chart was in response to a Bloomberg article that said endowments uh, had, you know, some maybe Harvard and Yale had underperformed the S&P 500. And the, the tone was sort of uh, was sort of reproachful. Like, why haven't they outperformed the S&P 500? These guys are really smart. And the obvious answer for why an endowment might not outperform the S&P 500 is because that's not the right benchmark, right? Endowments might have might prefer a different risk profile than going all in on stocks, which is why they tend to diversify across asset classes, and also why they tend to underperform stocks over time. At least most endowments, you know, David Swenson at Yale is an exception. Scott Malpass at Notre Dame is an exception. But most diversified allocators of capital are not going to outperform stocks over the long run, and that's by design. It's also why most hedge funds. You know, you'll see articles like most hedge funds underperform the S&P 500. It's just not the right benchmark. The reason it's not the right benchmark is because stocks are very, very risky, and that gets obscured uh, years and years into a bull market. And since since the great financial crisis, we've had a really good run in stocks, which has led, led people, even somewhat experienced investors, into thinking that really stocks only go up, or maybe you could run a successful endowment only allocating into stocks. And... Uh, I think looking back at history really provides some useful perspective. This data on the slide is from the, the Schiller database from Robert Schiller at Yale. And you can see why a long-term allocator like Harvard or Yale or whomever might not want to be 100% invested in stocks all the time. Um, as the chart says, there are four decade plus periods when stocks have been flat from 1906 to 1922, uh, from 1929 to 1949. So that was post the Great Depression from 1969 to 1984, that was through the, the 70s. This chart is inflation adjusted. So obviously the really high inflation of the 70s put a lot of downward pressure on the real returns of the S&P 500 over that time. And then again, from 2000 to 2013. So uh, that's something that you have to be aware of as an investor. I'll make one more point before, before pausing. There are certain initial conditions that make periods of time like this more likely. Obviously, uh, well, high inflation is obviously something that's been shared among some of these periods of time. That's not an initial condition. An initial condition, though, is high valuations, right? High valuations today mean low low returns over some period in the future. There are a variety of metrics you can look at. Uh, one of the best is the, the Schiller uh, cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio. Right now, uh, it's a little bit over 30. So the S&P 500 index is trading at something like 30 times average earnings over the last 10 years. And so if you were to run a back test, what that implies is you should expect roughly 0% real returns over the next 10 years. Um, so this isn't guaranteed. The regression doesn't have 100% explanatory power. It's got something like you know, 50% explanatory power, but that's still remarkably high, right? If valuations imply 0% real returns over the next 10 years, uh, you know what that says is if you're a long-term investor, if you really have a 10-year investment horizon, and some places do, right? Like endowments, uh, it makes sense to cut back on your equity allocation on the basis of valuations. It should be uh, influencing your equity allocation lower. So anyway, I'll, I'll pause there. That might have been that. Uh, well, so uh, two, two quick things on that. Number one, so valuation is kind of a pull forward of stock prices, right? I mean, if you have excessive valuations, you've pulled forward returns into the past or into the current, and then you have to make up for that at some point. Now, again, not 100% of the time, but at some point you have to make up for that and level out. Is that seemingly correct? 
That's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the gist of it, right? We've seen really, really good returns over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, stocks have outperformed the, you know, the economy, so to speak. And so uh, historically, when that happens, returns over the subsequent 10 years or 15 years tend to be much worse. And so that brings so, me to the, my second thing, Jim, this is more of a comment, Jimmy. So just, no, no, fine. Yeah, yeah. just go on after I say this. I've been trying to explain to people for years that a lot of people will say the endowments are hedge funds. Okay, fine, whatever. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But people have lost what the definition of a hedge fund is. A hedge fund, you, it used to be more important when they first started talking publicly about hedge funds that they outperformed to the downside, not to the upside. That was the big deal of a hedge fund because anybody could just buy the S&P 500, even before ETFs. If you had enough money, you could just buy the S&P 500. And you wouldn't have to worry about beating the index. You were in the index, right? And you, you just had to rebalance a little bit. But I, I think that's a key point for people to understand, especially these stupid all-day news channels that you shouldn't watch. You should be on the Trading Air Hub. You should be on our podcast and anything else that Jim and I do. And you should buy Invictus Research because these TV shows, they, they look at something and they go, well, uh, NVIDIA is up 70% and you're up 30. Why are you underperforming NVIDIA? It's like the dumbest ass question I, I've ever heard in my life. But then in yeah. October, when stocks are down, they're bringing in people that are like, well, you know, the S&P is down 20%. You're only down 12%. So, I mean, you're doing okay. He's doing fantastic right. if he's beating the index to the downs. That's what they're supposed to do. Sorry. It was a comment. So, no. What you have? No, I, I, no, I was wanted to talk. Well, okay. One thing Bobby said that I wanted to add on real quick. There is a – Bobby and I have been in uh, mainstream media – I was in mainstream media for 20 years. There's a reason that it, it, we watch it and think that it sucks. And I'm not trying to pitch our product, but they have shit tons of sponsorship. You better believe they're not going to downgrade Pfizer stock when Pfizer is one of their biggest advertisers. Plus, they like to play to the lowest common denominator for just for, for pizzazz. You know what I mean? And tr so imagine trying to restrict Mike Singleton to a six minute conversation and understand his thesis big, on this bingo. business it's, cycle. Exactly. It's complicated shit. So thank you for joining us here today. And thank you for listening to that rant. Mike. Okay, one of my favorite things, and it has been for years, is the Greenspan model evaluating stocks, which is earnings yield compared to compared to what part of the treasury curve? I, I always said like first like investable sort of bonds. So I was like seven year to 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 ten year. And that's now that's now crisscross. Now when we talk about stocks having a difficult time over the next 10, 10 years, how big a part is it the fact that the earnings yield in the S P is now below the safe rate? Uh, it's a great point. I mean, you could construct that that model I was talking about using an equity risk premium model instead of the price to earnings model. But the outcome is this is the same, basically, right? The lower the equity risk premium today, the lower returns are in the future. And actually, it's 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 a you can interpret it really, really simply and be largely correct. If the equity risk premium today is one percent, it's it's almost accurate to say that expected returns over the next ten years should be one percent, right? It's 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 almost that simple. So. Right now, I think the equity risk premium on a cyclically adjusted basis is about one and a half or two percent, and so it's it's a little different than the, the price to earnings model, but it's close. So, so when you the chart you put up there, does we haven't talked about dividends at all too? We're talking they become important when we're talking about 10, 12 year periods, fifteen year periods. Um, does do those periods look as ugly and as sideways when you add in um, dividend returns? So I should have mentioned this earlier. That chart did include dividends. It was a total oh, return. Excellent. Yeah. Oh, so it's good. equally ugly. <laughs> yeah, those, that's plenty ugly then. I don't need it to be any other uglier. So are we saying, and Bobby, I, this is a question then to you too, before you take the next question. Are we really sitting here saying when we look out the next 10 years, that the next years could be like running in eight inches of mud as far as equity investing goes? Do you think that, Bobby? Because I kind of um, do. I do a little bit. There's a professor that's on mainstream business media all the time, and his name is escaping me right now, but he has a book that he updates every couple of years. He updates the S&P earnings. I wish I could remember his name, but he updated it recently to include this past year, and the S&P is running basically 8% a year, um, including dividends, not inflation adjusted um, mm. forever. And you know now we uh, Tina's out the window because you can get 5% on a 30-year, right? And, Tina was there is no alternative for people who right for people who don't know yeah. and so you can buy a 30-year bond and go okay i'm going to underperform the s p by three percent but i don't have to deal with any of those periods that mike just showed on that chart any of as long as it's holds a maturity <laughs> right not silicon valley bank stuff 
So yeah, it is possible because money has to flow into equities for equities to go higher. That's the the basis of it. Again, coming from the trading floor, when Jim and I saw a lot of people buying, we, we bought. We didn't even need to know why. You know, it's like, okay, wow, there's a lot of people buying and a lot of people are backing off. So we got to buy too, right? So money has to flow in. And the equity markets to me have always had a natural upward bias. Mike, maybe your research at Invictus shows different. But with there's always a certain amount of money that in long only funds and pension funds and, and 401ks that they have to buy stocks at the end of the month or the beginning of the month. So they have a slight upward bias, which is part of the reason I like commodities so much because the two way trade seems more fair. I was going to add, actually, so a couple of things that chart is adjusted for inflation. So it's not flat nominal returns. The you know, nominal returns might be oh, three or four or five percent. The real returns are flat. But that brings up a good point is that when stocks are flat in real terms, that almost always means there is a better alternative. And a lot of times through inflationary periods, it's commodities, right? So a big benefit of being a cross asset investor is that you have the opportunity to invest in commodities through the 70s, right? And commodities compounded at, you know, something like 15% over 15 years when stocks were compounding at, you know, maybe four or 5% nominally. Uh, so again, you have, a, you have a document you threw into one of your daily edges that had the equity sector back test and in faster growth, higher inflation, energy was at the top and in slower growth, higher inflation, energy was at the top. Basic materials was, I think, in second place during faster, faster. And it was like in fourth during faster, slower. So always with inflation, you had base, basic materials and energy at the top. And I assume that's what you're referring to. Right, right. And the last, you know, the period of time between 2008 and 2021 was so anomalous in terms of just how benign inflation was. And it was benign in the face of, uh, you know, a bunch of reasons to think inflation was going to go up uh, that I think it, it, it warped expectations about how economics works. And I think that it also just creates recency bias, but yeah, energy stocks don't have to underperform <laughs> through every regime over and over and over again. I mean, historically, there have been plenty of regimes in which energy stocks have done very well. So, so Jim and so, I both think that okay, everyone watching any of our shows that you're on should subscribe to what you do, but uh, you're not a broker and you're not somebody who says, just because you think there might be more downside, you don't put on a good long equity trade, right? Sure, right. Well, it depends on your risk tolerances and whatnot, but, but yes. Okay. So my question, we've seen some economic data that I think has been surprising as hell to the upside, the retail sales number, the jobs numbers. I don't, I looked at those jobs numbers and I think it's time to call bullshit on some of it too. Those job numbers, which were showing, you know, just a crap ton of part-time jobs, second jobs, government jobs, and very and much less, you know, stable full-time jobs, private sector jobs. But anyway, it's a two-part question. One, is the economy, uh, it, am I too hard on it? Is the, I think the economy's had a new recession, but again, I've been late on this for two quarters already. And two, why the hell hasn't the rate hikes slowed growth and broken up demand like they were supposed to? So I think it's important to, when you're talking about the economy, to divide it into the relevant parts. So broadly speaking, you could say there's the goods economy and the services economy, and you could even fit housing within the goods economy. Um, and the reason it's important to do that is because they are policy sensitive to varying degrees. Housing is extremely sensitive to policy, which is to say sensitive to interest rates and services much less so. In fact, you, you could say that the influence of uh, interest rate policy really only affects services through the goods economy. And uh, I, can, I can walk through that really quickly if you'd like. Please. So sure. obviously we've seen mortgage rates go from sub 3% to almost 8% now. And the impact on housing has been remarkable. So it's easy to say, well, like, man, GDP growth looks like it's going to come in at 6% nominally. Uh, and inflation is still kind of close to 4%. It doesn't seem like these rate hikes have had any impact on the economy at all. But if you look at the most policy sensitive part of the economy, which is to say housing, it's had enormous impact. Total home sales are down 40% from peak. Mortgage applications are down 63% from peak. Uh, these are numbers that, you know, are, are within the vicinity of the great financial crisis and, and 2008, which was obviously the worst housing market of all time. This is a different housing market in terms of uh, supply and demand dynamics, but but this is just to say that housing activity is extremely suppressed, right? So, so Fed policy is having an impact. 
And uh, housing is a leading indicator because it influences the good, goods economy, right? Most people are, uh, you know, they're, they're buying household goods along with their, their house. You know, they're buying cars and furniture and, uh, you know, s- stuff like that. And it's, it's, uh, it follows the housing economy, so to speak. And, you, and you've watched uh, demand for durable goods decline precipitously in the face of uh, this, this sort of affordability crisis in housing. And uh, generally, manufacturing activity follows demand for durable goods because durable goods are manufactured goods. That's why the PMI data has been really, really weak. And, uh, you know, eventually the manufacturing sector can't suppress production and continue to operate in the face of such weak demand indefinitely, and they start to lay people off. We have seen labor market conditions soften, particularly for manufacturing companies and other cyclically sensitive parts of the economy, like trucking and temporary staffing and stuff like that. It's been, uh, the headline data has been a little bit better as it always is, right? Manufacturing and interest rate sensitive parts of the economy always lead, headline always follows, services always kind of lags headline. Um, I would also point out though that the unemployment rate is up from 3.4% to 3.8%. I know that, you know, if you're bullishly inclined, you'll probably say, hey, that's due to labor force expansion. That's not really due to a rise in the unemployment level. But if you look back at historical recessions, about 30% of the increase in the unemployment rate through historical recessions is just the result of labor force expansion and payroll growth not keeping up with labor force expansion. So in other words, the rise in the unemployment rate can come from layoffs or it can come from not hiring people fast enough uh, or not hiring. And so, you know, the fact that the unemployment rate has increased from 3.4% to 3.8%, it's not inconsistent with past recessions, even though, you know, you could say, well, labor force expansion is a good thing. I got kind of a two part question and I have a theory I want to throw out first. So my theory is that holiday spending is going to be well past robust. Like there was already a survey done that said that people were planning on 60 some odd percent of people were planning on spending the same or more as they did last year, which was a little surprising to me. And then I thought about it. I said, okay, summer of strikes, right? 650,000 people went on strike. That's more than 2018 and 19 combined, right? And a lot of them won, right? Now, we could argue about, actually, I don't even think we need to argue about their wages are still not higher than the last five or six years of inflation, but at least they've got a little bit of a catch up in there and they think they're rich now. And I'm not saying that sarcastically. They think they have more money now and they're going to go out and blow it on their family and friends in the holidays. And that is going to set us up for an awful 2024 down the road when those bills come due. So my question, that's my theory. My question is this, does Invictus have a view either historically or otherwise on consumer holiday spending juxtaposed to what's been going on with the savings rate and consumer credit? No, not not really. And generally the figures that we look at are seasonally adjusted. And so the holiday spending doesn't impact the, the numbers that they're, they're literally adjusted so that Christmas spending doesn't unduly influence the calculations. Uh, you know, and those seasonal adjustments are never perfect, which is why we don't rely overly much on one specific, you know, time series. But, um, you know, I think that, look, as long as, uh, you know, employment, you know, payrolls are growing one and a half percent, wage growth is growing four percent. That means incomes are growing five and a half percent. That's fast relative to the last 10 or 15 years. That money has to get spent somewhere. A lot of it will end up getting spent in services, right? You know, mo- movie tickets or going out to dinner or whatnot. And that's because the housing market is locked up. So people, you can't afford a house. So you go watch Barbie or Oppenheimer or whatever. You know, you go spend $30 instead of spending, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars or, you know, a couch, you know, a couch is a couple thousand dollars. It's it's easier to go out and enjoy a nice dinner than it is to go buy a new couch. And that's basically what's happened with the economy. So, uh, you know, you know, maybe a little Johnny will be getting, a, you know, a, a dinner out instead of a new toy. I, I, I don't know. But basically, until the labor market breaks, I think that you should expect that dynamic to persist. Then when the labor market breaks, you can say the consumer is strong and the consumer has excess savings. I dispute some of that. But the consumer will remain, quote unquote, fine until the labor market breaks. Right. As soon as the unemployment rate goes up, as soon as people start losing their jobs, uh, one, obviously, that reduces employment. But that also creates slack in the labor market, which means even for people that do have jobs, wage growth goes down. So, you know, the whole strong consumer thing, you just have to remember that that's um that's it's a lagging conversation yeah 
I have to clarify something because I, when I said juxtapose, juxtapose with the consumer savings rate and, and the credit card, credit cards, I believe credit card debt is past pre-pandemic pre -pandemic levels as our defaults. I could be wrong on that, but I think it is. Yes, I think you're right. Okay. So I think that's why it's going to set us up for an awful 2024 at some point because the bills are going to come due and the savings rate is way down. I don't know where that is relative to pre-pandemic levels. Maybe you do. And the debt service rate, I mean, on your credit card has got to have gone from, you know, what, from 16% to 24%. Do you know the exact statistics, either one of you? It's gone up hugely. But anyway, right. was Oppenheimer yeah, a good movie, anymore. by the way? What? Was Oppenheimer good? Did you guys see it? I didn't see it. Mike, I didn't did see it. I, I usually watch Christopher Nolan movies with my brothers and with some friends from back home. And we haven't gotten together yet, so we haven't watched it yet. But I... I, think we I have a okay. funny story about Oppenheimer. The theater was playing close by, serves booze. And when I walked in, there was a bunch of uh, Irish guys that we know that were already sitting at the bar waiting to go see the MMA fights that they were also showing in the theater. So by the time the Oppenheimer movie started, I was like 10 drinks in with these Irish guys. And I instead went, instead went to watch like Patty O'Flanagan versus Mick something <laughs> or other and just was screaming at the MMA fights and never got into Oppenheimer. That's nothing to do with yeah. Notre Dame, of course. Go ahead. I'd see it though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, Mike, the, I want to gear this conversation. I have three topics written down: gold and Bitcoin, or either one of those as assets, or the way technology is going to affect inflation going forward. The next big thing, maybe AI. Which one of those things do you think is more fun to discuss right now? I think I think you know I've been observing the moves in Bitcoin and gold just like anyone else. Both Bitcoin and gold tend to be inverse with interest rates, specifically real interest rates. I don't need but to say not. it again. <laughs> interest rates interest rates have been going up, but gold and Bitcoin have also been going up. So that's very unusual. It's not. It's a uh, gold. I, I'm I'm really hesitant to get long until it breaks out above two thousand dollars an ounce because I think that you know, you were, you're it's buying right below resistance. In my experience, it's just a recipe for, for frustration. And so, uh, you know, but, but that said that this move has gotten my attention. It's clearly when the, when the market is doing something, it shouldn't, that's always a reason to pay attention. And I think that, um, you know, you, you've got to watch, it, it makes sense that gold would start to outperform over the next few months. It makes sense that you know, if there is a recession, gold would be an asset that outperforms and rates will start to go down. Maybe gold is sniffing that out a little bit early. But, uh, you know, $2,000 an ounce is the level I'm watching. So I like that you said that, though, because so many people are like, oh, gold has gone up on geopolitical concerns on global awful headlines. That's not when gold went up. Gold went up right. when it became clear that we were going to be spending a shit ton of money. And gold was like, crap, you know, that, that's what I thought, too. Now, Bitcoin, that seems like an easier figure out. I mean, BlackRock, who is, you know, who is all of our bosses, they are the supreme leader, the supreme <laughs> being, and they are getting in to Bitcoin. And by, by the way, I'm not criticizing BlackRock. I, you know, I'm sure you could fire me. I don't know how exactly, but I think Bitcoin could, I mean, BlackRock can fire anybody, right? But anyway, so BlackRock getting into Bitcoin, that's giving it a broader appeal, correct? I mean, it's as simple as that, isn't it? Mike? Uh, it, you know, it could be. I will say that Bitcoin has done better. It's not just this breakout above $31,000 a coin or, or whatever that has caught my attention. I mean, Bitcoin should be down a lot more. You've got rates at 5%. You know, given the historical correlation, Bitcoin should have broken down below whatever its 2018 high was, $17,000 a coin. So the fact that it's doing as well as it has, even though it hasn't done great, obviously it's drawn down quite a bit. You know, it's just it's just got me watching it. Um, yeah. Pretty you know, and I look, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm hopeful that, you know, Bitcoin was one of my best trades personally in 2020. I hope Bitcoin goes to the moon. Uh, I don't think it's a great risk adjusted bet at this point in the in the cycle. But, you know, I'm waiting for it to be a good risk adjusted bet again, because I would love to I'd love to be a buyer eventually. You know, Bitcoin to me, Jimmy, is having its NVIDIA moment right now where, yeah. you know, the ETFs are in the headlines and, you know, BlackRock actually listed. Well, I should say that the DTTC li listed BlackRock's ETF, even though it's not tradable and not approved, it's on their uh, Trading Corp page now, so you can find it. But it's got no price and you can't trade it. So that was almost like a. <laughs> well, they you took know, it off that, that page, the, by the way. I see that as the horse's head in the bed by uh, by BlackRock <laughs> to, to Gary Gensler. But um, I, I think it's having its NVIDIA moment. We talked about this uh, a few minutes ago where you know NVIDIA went up 70% or so since mid May, and then it lost about 50% of that. 
when people realize, okay, you probably got to be in an AI stock, but you don't have to be in it right now. And you probably should understand why you need, you need to be in it. And the way Bitcoin is rocketing up now, I understand why, but a lot of people are going to expect the approval of the ETFs to rocket it even higher. And I suspect that move down is if you want to be in it long term for that reason, there's going to be a 40, 50 percent move down from wherever the rumor move pops sell off. Back. Yeah. yeah. Just like, remember Pfizer stock after the uh, emergency use authorization got approved? It collapsed. Oh, it did collapse. Okay. Yeah, it, it moved up into the authorization. Then okay. it collapsed. Buy the rumor, sell the back. We've been saying that forever, right? Yeah, I just remember because yeah. I was long Pfizer prior and I sold it just before the approval, just because that's what our process told us to. It had nothing to do. We all know I'm, I'm an idiot. It was just the process. But I remember a friend of mine going, it's going to be approved. I'm hanging on. I'm like, well, okay, I'm not. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I had another question. Oh, the, the AI, the tech thing. Because I always, when the 70s, when uh, Paul Volcker came and destroyed and slayed inflation and rose, rates rose up too, it also happened to correspond with one of the biggest deflationary tools of all time, the internet, which allowed you know productivity gains that were unbelievable. Is AI that kind of power? Can AI keep inflation lower by making companies more productive? So yes. I mean, I think another mental model for inflation, I don't know if I said this one already, but inflation is generally equal to wage growth, less productivity growth. So if productivity growth is faster because of artificial intelligence or the internet or whatever else, that's a, that's a headwind for inflation. It's also a tailwind for real growth. So productivity is like you know, the magic sauce that you that capitalism sprinkles over an economy that creates these incredible outcomes where, where real growth and output growth is really strong and inflation is very modest. Um, so in, in, in principle, yes, uh, it could be all of those things. That said, it's not the only thing that matters, right? And I was just looking at the most recent treasury PowerPoint slide earlier today and the estimates that the treasury is putting out for budget deficits and new issuance over the next five or six years, along with the estimates from the OMB and the CBO. And I think that if we are and those estimates vary wildly, right? The Treasury, you know, thinks that, you know, deficits aren't going to be they're going to be one to two trillion dollars for the next five years. CBO and OMB think they're going to be much higher. Um, it's a lot to say, like, well, the government continue can continue to run deficits between five and seven percent of GDP and we won't have inflation because artificial intelligence is going to provide just the right amount of secret sauce to keep inflation at 2% over yeah. the long run. You know, I think we very well could have 2% inflation again, but I, I think it's, it's, it's putting too much weight on the, uh, the artificial intelligence thing to say, well, like, the you know, everything else can go wrong, but as long as we have artificial intelligence that, you know, we're going to see policy perfect 2% inflation forever. I think that's probably unrealistic. Okay, so you've mentioned, we've mentioned issuance a lot. You've mentioned issuance quite a bit. Is it safe to say that you are saying what we've seen with government spending, particularly inflationary periods over the last two and a half to three years, is wildly irresponsible, kind of irresponsible? Where do you, where do you register? Uh, so, I mean, I'll start with the Milton Friedman quote, right? Inflation is always and everywhere a function of growth in the money supply and growth in output, right? So, like, theoretically, if we had such an incredibly productive technology sector, private sector that you know productivity was so fast, the Fed could print money, a lot of money, and you wouldn't see inflation because the private sector would be productive enough to offset it. Obviously, that's uh, that's pretty unrealistic. Um, you know, I, I think there has to be a policy a policy change to see inflation come back down to two percent over the long run, right? Like, I don't know that there's any. Well, that's not true. I was going to say, I don't think that there's any precedent for running deficit, deficits like this and seeing 2% inflation over the long run. Maybe Japan is an exception to that. But uh, I would say that it is, Im it is imprudent if you're running fiscal deficits that result in uh, you know, massive deposit growth and, and, and things like checking account and savings accounts for populations that have high propensities to consume, which the US does. I think that you're more likely to see outcomes like we saw in 2020 and 2021 and 2022 than you are to see something like Japan, right? If consumption growth is outpacing uh, real output for the economy, you know that differential is inflation every time. It's mathematically true. So if the deficits you're running are funding things like entitlements or universal basic income or otherwise 
uh, it's some some sort of way of goosing consumer spending, like that will be inflationary. That's the type of deficit that will be inflationary. And if it's, you know, on the order of five or six percent of GDP over a long period of time, it's just not consistent with two percent inflation. So, so let me let me just so on the dumb shit scale of their spending over the last zero being no dumb shit at all, ten being just you know record setting dumb shit. How what what number of dumb dumb shittedness was spending all this money over the last two and a half years? <laughs> so it's funny. It's it's a in a sense it was really smart because the reverse repo facility has cushioned some of the impact on rates. Nice point. So yeah. You could say, "Wow, that was really sharp." I can't believe they did that. It was probably an accident. <laughs> But once so the, that's starting at six right there. Right. Okay, go. So if you remove the impact of the reverse repo facility, right, rates rates might be 50 or 100 basis points higher. We might be in a recession today. You know, then it would be a 10 of 10. It'd be pretty stupid. And of course, it's not easy to stop spending money once you start it. So the impact isn't just acute. It's also secular, right? You know, that, that that's how you go from having an acute inflation episode of, oh, we had five or 6% inflation for a year or two to, oh my gosh, we're in a 10-year period of inflation that we can't get back down. Right. So okay. I'm really happy you're the age you are for this question because and we've Is talked this the last questions. question? We gotta let them go. We yeah, can't them all day, right? It's yeah. the last it's the last question. Good. Jim Bianco, I heard Jim Bianco this morning say that part of the reason we haven't seen as much of an effect um, on the economy as we should have, given the magnitude of the rate hikes, is because the unusual rate regime was from 20, 2009 to 2020, not now. He goes, this is normalizing. So the first 200, 300 basis points of the rate hike was normalizing. And now we're actually tight. Now, I know he didn't mean actual financial conditions, right? He was pushing back. And, and I've said this before on other shows. I had a conversation with a young anchor one time. And I mentioned to her that about 37% of the C-suite of the S&P 500 wasn't even out of high school last time. Rates were this high. And her response to me was, yeah, but they can read. And I'm like, you're missing my point. So as somebody who's young, but is also historically, uh, your depth of knowledge in the markets historically is, is as good as anyone. What do you think of Jim's com comments? And can we actually live in a new rate regime where 8% mortgages are the high rather than sort of the midpoint? Well, I mean, how long can you tread water with uh, 20 pound weights around your ankles? You know, see, like guys our age would think 8% had we not gone through the last few years. That'd be like a three pound weight. That yeah, well, the, the, the economy is different. This is why the Fed uses the, the model of the neutral rate, right? Is yeah. the, the, the long-term neutral rate should be something like long-term growth in the labor force plus long-term growth in labor productivity. In the year 2000, the assumed neutral rate was very high because that was like peak women entering the workforce. Yeah. Also, it was peak productivity from the dot-com bubble. So like, you know, you could have made a case for a 5% neutral rate back then. And I think now it's hard to make a case for a neutral rate above a percent and a half. And we're talking, uh, you know, the neutral rate is a real rate, not to get that confused, but but it's hard Actually, to make it to the people watching real quick. Then we'll let you go. So anyway, 5% a 5% uh, Fed funds rate is much different today than it was back then. Today, I would say it's the equivalent of a 20 pound weight. And the reason it doesn't work for very long is because the US economy can't work without the housing sector and the good sector working. Uh, and right now it just looks good because a lot of that spending that would have gone into housing or into good spending is getting squeezed into services because housing and goods are too expensive. Uh, and the result is this, oh, you know, you know, this inflated Atlanta Fed now cast and wow, the economy continues to run really hot and consumer spending on services is five or six percent and doesn't seem like it's going down. That, that's true, but the, you know, you have to look at the leading indicators too and what they imply about the direction of the labor market. And again, like, Services spending isn't going to calm down until you see breaks in the labor market. And, you know, our best guess at Invictus is that, you know, in Q1 and Q2 is when you see the unemployment rate go from something like 4% to something like 7%. And that's when services starts to get hit hard, too. I love that. I love, again, Bobby said this at the beginning, and I'll tell you guys out there listening to literally the first thing I get like four emails in the morning that are market uh, related and I pop on Invictus Research first, just, and it's not just the depth of your knowledge, but it's the plainness of it as well. You, you just put it out there. There's no, some people like to use big words to make themselves sound smart. People who are actually smart don't need to. And I really appreciate that too. And also you people listening too, if respond to the show, tweet us, contact us. If you want more charts, more entry points, things like that, tell us that. We wanna, we wanna tailor the show for what all you people like, but Mike, 
Thanks so much for being here. Bobby, you got anything else? Yeah, Mike, tell everybody where they can reach you. And I want to add to what Jim said. Mike's research, it's not political. It's not biased in one direction or the other. It's just what he reads on the charts. It's kind of similar to Mike Arnold's technical analysis. You know, it's just like he, he isn't concerned with why it's going on, just what's going on. And it's right. critical for active investors to look at research like his. Mike, where can they find you? Well, that's very nice, guys. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, at invictus-research.com. Right now, we're running a 30-day free trial for uh, for our products. Uh, the the uh, discount code is macro trial, um, and that's the you know the, the the discount applies to the daily edge, weekly trade ideas, and the monthly market outlook. So it's a relatively unusual thing. We usually don't run discounts like this, but uh, it's it's funny. I'm on your show the day after I I uh, I just launched one. You can also find same. me on. Sorry. No, I said that's outstanding. That's very cool. Oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's very good on? timing. And then uh, my Twitter account is at Invictus Macro. And also, and I want to throw we're not affiliates of Invictus. We don't get paid if you sign up. So not at all. And I will it. say this too: we compliment Mike so much, and he's never even given us one compliment. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, yeah, we it's open. at it him like crazy. When you were doing that <laughs> bullshit meter, I thought you were trying to get him to do it. Mike is going, "Well, that's really like a four bullshit," and he goes, "No, that's kind of dumb." Right. Someday we'll get it out of it. Thank you very you guys, much. You guys are too kind. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks, Mike. Yeah.